got disease but survived. And this is a stark uh, example of how host genetics can influence TB. And this is not too surprising if you look at the, what we would call the life cycle of, of this disease. And so let's have a quick look at this. I'm not gonna be showing you very much you don't know, but let's get everyone on the same page. So what happens is if someone has cavitary TB, they cough it up, and then these, uh, these fine aerosols that contain the bacteria get breathed down by an individual who's next to them. And now the, the, the interplay between the host and the bacterium begins. The bacterium is swallowed by the alveolar macrophages that patrol the lung. And at this point, they can either be killed by the alveolar macrophage, in which case everything's, you know, the game's over, the host is fine, or if they don't get killed because they've also learned how to survive in these, uh, in these cells, then the cells actually take them deep and you get um, these uh, formation of, new, of a macrophage aggregate in the interstitium of the lung. As you know, TB is not a superficial lung disease, it's an interstitial slash um, a lymph node disease. And so then you get this you know, this, this quintessential structure that's called the granuloma. And now here too, there's op many options because one of them is the host can just clear the disease. And that's what happens when you see people with cleared, healed, calcified lesions, or the host uh, can succumb. And now you can, get, you can get a necrotic granuloma. And that is the critical part that is needed for transmission because it is from this necrotic debris that the bacteria are most able to get coughed up and, and transmit. And you can see that this is going to involve lots and lots of host, uh, host features. You've got ability of macrophages to kill the bacteria. You've got the ability of macrophages to get recruited and thereby do the bidding of the bacterium. You've got now the ability of the granuloma to either kill the bacteria or not. And then you've got a, a situation where this granuloma might not undergo necrosis and then might slowly heal, or it might go on, undergo necrosis causing a lot of morbidity and mortality to the patient as well as transmission. And so there's a lot of host pathways involved here. So it's not a surprise that there's going to be many, many, many different reasons that people might be more resistant or more susceptible to TB. Does that make sense? Not if it makes sense. Yes. yes, no. yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Because I need some feedback from you guys because I can't really see you. Okay. So what I decided to do many years ago when I was a postdoc was to explore TB in a, in a different organism. And the organism I chose was Mycobacterium marinum. Mycobacterium marinum was first discovered when it was, um, when fish in the Philadelphia Aquarium that I'm pointing to here were dying of a disease that looked a lot like TB. So they had, they had a wasting disease, they had tubercles, and when they did the, when they, when they did the autopsy, they found tubercles and they found acid fast bacteria. But what they couldn't do when they tried to culture these, they couldn't grow anything until this man, Joseph Aronson, had the brilliant idea that if fish are getting TB 
then they probably are getting TB with an, a, a, a temperature, a, a cold adapted bacterium because uh, fish are cold blooded. And so he tried culturing the bacteria, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the lesions at 30 degrees, and now they were able to grow a bacterium that looked um, exactly very similar to mycobacterium. Now, mycobacterium marinum was then rediscovered about 30 years later as the cause of a disease called fish tank granuloma or aquarium tank granulomas or swimmers granulomas in humans. And in humans, it causes a peripheral disease. And why is that? Because we're warm blooded. So it's only gonna be in the, cold, in the cooler parts of our, of our body, which is the extremities. And when, when you look at these lesions, if you, if you were to do an, a biopsy of them, they have granulomas and look for all the world like TB. So, uh, so this seemed like a really nice model. Uh, and in particular, it seemed like a really nice model because we could interrogate this disease using the zebrafish. And the zebrafish, which I'll tell you about in, more in a minute, is a very nice model organism. And it was already known that zebrafish get TB with mycobacterium marinum, just like all cold-blooded animals. So let me show you what a fish granuloma looks like. This is data from our own lab. Here is a human granuloma. This is just a hematoxyl and eosin stain. So you can't see the bacteria, but what you can see is a very organized lesion. You can see these blue nuclei here because those are where you have intact macrophages. And what you will see here in the middle is an area where there are no nuclei. And why is that? Because the macrophages have undergone necrosis. So that is the necrotic center of the granuloma. Here's a fish granuloma, but this is now stained with a modified zeal nielsen stain. So you can see the bacteria. Again, you can see a very nicely organized lesion. You can see that there are cellular areas where there are a few bacteria, and you can see that in the necrotic region, the bacteria really grow like wildfire because they don't have any constraints from the immune, immunity offered by macrophages. So this is looking very similar then to a caseating human granuloma. But the real beauty of the fish is that for the first three weeks of life, it's transparent. And, when it's, tra and it's transparent and it's small. And what you can do is you can infect these fish with the bacteria and you can use bacteria that have been rendered fluorescent by the expression of green fluorescent protein or red fluorescent protein. And you can see in this larva that there are individual macrophages here, 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 here that are infected. And then you can also see that these, these macrophages have gathered together in places and these are the granulomas. And so that is this phase over here. And we wanted to examine this more closely. So we engineered the zebrafish to have green fluorescent macrophages. And we also had, had it have red fluorescent neutrophils because these also enter granulomas. And now we had a look by in infecting them with blue fluorescent bacteria. And what you can see is this very nice tight granuloma that has formed. And you can see that there are some infected macrophages, some uninfected macrophages, and a few wandering neutrophils in here. And you can also see that this granuloma is fully cellular. It's this phase. It hasn't yet undergone necrosis. So the question is, can we also see this necrotic phase in there? And, when you, and you can let this go further, and indeed, you can, you can see that, but I'm going to get to that in a minute. And so what I want to show you now is just so you understand how we do these experiments, these larvae are very tiny. So this is the US penny, that's Lincoln. And the larva is so tiny that it fits in the cravat of Lincoln right there. And so we have to want, find ways to manipulate these guys. So one way you can infect them is that you can simply soak them with the bacteria and they will get infected. But that's not a great way to do the kinds of experiments you want to do to look at genetic susceptibilities because what you want to do is you want to make sure that every 
creature got exactly the same dose at pretty much the same time. In other words, that is what happened in that Lubeck experiment, the sad Lubeck experiment that I showed you, where all the kids got the same dose of BCG at the same time in their lives, right? So to do that, we devised a microinjection device. So what we do here is this is a glass needle, a capillary needle that we've hand pulled, and then we break off the tip. And in it are the bacteria, and we've put in some red dye so that you can see the bacteria get in there. And you now, the, the bacterium has a cavity that's called, called the hindbrain ventricle, and it's identical to what is our fourth ventricle. And this is a nice cavity to work in because it's got an epithelium lining. So, you know, we can pretend it's the lung because, as you know, fish don't have lungs. And we can actually put the bacteria there and we can watch things happen in this cavity, which is quite a nice way to do it. So what we do is we take the fish, this is the yolk of the fish, and we have a little vacuum device that we will hang on to. And you'll see that I'm going to hold the fish by the vacuum device and I'm going to inject it. And so there you can see now that the fish is getting injected. Now, another way you can inject them is into the bloodstream. And that for that, we use this little hockey stick like device and you can inject the fish and you can again see, I'm going to show it to you one more time. You can see the bugs going in directly into the blood. And so you can do all these kinds of tricks. Now, the, now, one last thing I want to show you before we get to some biology is that, okay, now what you can do with these fish is they're tiny enough that you can array them into these 96 well plates. And you can take the whole plate and you can anesthetize the fish by giving them hypothermal anesthesia. And what this means is you just stick the plate on ice and now the fish will stop moving. If you stick the plate on ice for 10 minutes, the, the fish will stop moving and they'll stay not moving for 10 minutes. And that's in that time, you can put them on an inverted microscope, a fluorescent microscope with a, with a uh, motorized stage so that e you know, it'll automate, automatically take pictures of each well and you will get pictures that look like this. This is not high resolution, but it's enough to see how infected the fish is. And then you can write some computer code, very simple code, and you can quantify how many bacteria are in the fish. And so you can do this every day and you can do what is actually called dots. You can treat these fish with rifampicin and isoniazid and you can see how quickly they're responding. So it's a very powerful system because you can watch the same animal every day with whatever treatment or genetic manipulation you've done. So on this backdrop, we did a genetic screen. And I, what I want to, what I'm, I'm going to describe this to you in a little bit in words. So what we did was we took fish and we made random mutations in them using a chemical agent, ethyl nitrosiurea. So we now have fish. Each fish is going to have a different mutation because it's a stochastic process where the ethyl nitrosurea is going to cause these transitions and transversions and some small, small breaks in the DNA. So each fish is going to have a unique mutation, but we don't know where these mutations are. All right. So these are this, this, what we do then is we take each fish and we screen it for whether it's behaving normally when infected with TB or whether it's looking over infected hyper susceptible. This type of genetic screen where you have no idea what you're screening for, where it, a completely agnostic screen is called a forward genetic screen. So you don't know what's going on. You just ask the, you're asking the fish to tell you what's important. And so we do that. We did that screen and we got multiple mutants that were susceptible, hyper susceptible to TB. And I'm going to tell you the story from now on of just one mutant. So here's the fish. And you can see this is the wild type sibling. And you can see it's got the few granulomas here. Now it doesn't take very much to see that the mutant sibling is highly infected. Look at this. And what is really nice about this is that a 
curious feature of TB, of mycobacterium tuberculosis, is that it forms these serpentine cords in culture. And until very recently, microbiology labs used to use cording as a way to see if the infection was from MTB. Now we have better methods. And um, cording was discovered by Robert Koch very soon after he discovered the bacillus. So that was in about 1882. What David in my lab realized was that cord, this cord, this phenotype that he was seeing in this mutant, if you looked in detail, it represented cording. They had formed these sort of cord-like structures. And what he and in, in fact, in contrast, in the wild type, you'll see that the bugs are in these little packages. And that's because these bugs are still in their macrophages. And what he realized here was that the, the bugs had caused the necrosis of the macrophages. And that is why they were able to come together and form these cords. And so he was able to show that this, this cording was, uh, was because of macrophage necrosis. But what was more important was that he was able to use this cording now to map the mutant. Because once you identify a mutant, you have to go back and do old fashioned genetic mapping. And you have to identify where the, where the mutation is, which is a long and arduous process, which I'm not gonna tell you about. Uh, and if you want, if anyone wants to read about it, read the paper by Tobin et al in 2010. And that will give you uh, the mapping strategy. But what was really cool was that David was able to use this map, this cording as a way to map the mutant because he was able to use it as a binary phenotype, cording, no cording. And this was what he used. And he identified where the, he was able to identify the exact spot where the mutation was. And if you, if you remember any Mendelian genetics, this was, if you do a heterozygous in cross of, uh, of, the, of the pair, you will see that in the wild type, you see very little cording. And in the het in cross, 25% are corded, which is exactly corresponding to a recessive phenotype for this. And when David, um, so now I want to show, now I want to just step back and tell you one more thing here. The cording that he was able to map actually looked very nice when he was able to look at those genetically engineered fish, which also had the macrophages. So here's the, 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 here's the mutation, here's the cellular granuloma, and here's the granuloma that has the cording. And what you can see is there's very little green because the macrophages have necrosed. And you can see that the bugs have come out and you can already see the bugs are starting to grow much more than the bugs that are constrained by the macrophages. So now let's get, get back to our mutant. And our mutant was in the arachidonic acid pathway. These are 20 carbon lipids. They're on the membranes of all cells. And in specifically, David's mutant mapped to leukotriene A4 hydrolase. And what he was able to show was <clears throat> that leukotriene A4 hydrolase if you didn't have it, you made, didn't make enough leukotriene B4 and you became susceptible to TB. Now, when, uh, when David, uh, so, so now here's where it starts to get a little bit complicated, but I'm gonna tell it to you the way it was because I want you to understand how science and medicine really progress. So, we had this idea that if you don't make enough of this enzyme, you're not able to mount a good inflammatory response. And because of that, you're getting uncontrolled macrophage growth. So that was, that was what our model was. That was what the fish was showing us. And at this point, we said, you know what? We are working with fish eggs. And if for anyone to believe us, we need to go and see if there's any relevance in a human system. And what David did then was to search the Thousand Genomes Project, and he found a he found that in the human leukotriene A4 hydrolase promoter, there was a C to T transition 
that was very common. So it was a common variant in the population. And he was able to show that in normal controls, the CC variant made the least leukotriene A4 hydrolase, the TT variant made the most, and the CTs were in between. So this was what we would have expected, right? So we then went to a cohort of TB meningitis patients in Vietnam, and we looked to see how this would behave. And what we had expected to see was the lows would, would fare the worst in type, this is now we're talking about mortality, that the lows, the CCs would do the worst, the worst and the CC, CTs would be in the middle, and the TTs might even do the best because they had the most inflammation. However, what we found was something else. We found in the humans that the CCs did, the, did badly, the CTs did the best, they hardly died, but the TTs did just as badly as the CCs. So we were getting what is called in genetics a heterozygous advantage model. So let's look at the human data now. In, in, so, okay, so what, before, I just wanna, I went ahead, got ahead of myself. So what this was telling us then was that leukotriene A4 high states, the TT state, was just as bad, and we could only assume that it was just as bad because it was making too much of the enzyme, and this was causing inflammation that was more over-optimal and was therefore deleterious. And, but we had no mechanistic details of this at this point. We just had human genetic association data. So uh, I'm gonna show you the data. Here is our human variant. It is, by the way, present commonly in all Indian uh, populations, including those that come to CMC Velour. It's 12 bases upstream of the uh, transcriptional start side of the gene, which is going in this direction. This is showing you that in normal controls, the genotype controls the expression of the protein. The CCs make the least, the CTs make the middle, the TTs make the most. Okay. Now, this is the data from TB meningitis in Vietnam. So here's a Vietnamese patient. These will look very similar to your TB meningitis patients. I don't need to tell you guys that this is a terrible disease with a high mortality despite really good care. And um, this, the reason for this is they get this basal meningitis and they get a very inflammatory uh, focus here. And this causes... Um, uh, it causes strokes, it causes cerebral edema, and all kinds of things. All right, I am not able to see the audience. Can, it, can you guys still see me? Yes, ma'am. We can okay. see you. Good. All right. So now let's look at the data. Um, this was the, so this was a, 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 a study done by Guy Thwaites and published in the New England Journal, and they had saved blood so we could make DNA. And so this is the overall survival of the patients, about 30%. And this is in the Wellcome Trust Center, very good center. Usually survival is even worse, although CMC Velour has excellent survival because we, we, we are doing studies there. So good for you, you all. So, um, so this is the overall survival. Now, I want you to be thinking along with me. If our prediction, <clears throat> so our prediction was that the, the CCs will do badly. And I'd already finished telling you that the TTs and, um, also do badly and the CTs do the best. And so here's the data. You can see these are the heterozygotes, these are the CTs, and you can see there's not that much mortality here. But look at the highs and the lows. All of the mortality really of this population is coming from these guys, right? However, now, now is where I really want you to think. Our fish data would predict that the highs. So I'm getting a lot of echo now. I don't know if there's something changed. Okay, it's better now. So our data would predict that the highs and the lows are dying for different reasons. We're predicting that the lows are dying because of too little inflammation, 
The hyes are dying because of too much inflammation and the heterozygotes have just right the optimal amount of inflammation and that's why they're not dying. And, but how does, how does one test this in humans? We didn't have any eicosanoid levels. We didn't have LTA4H uh, level. We didn't have you know, leukotriene levels, but we had something that allowed us to test this model. And that is that the reason that Guy had done this study in the first place was that he wanted to see if high dose glucocorticoids would help people with TB meningitis. Because for 50 years, people have been hand waving and just using TB menin uh, steroids and TB meningitis as adjunctive treatment along with antibiotics, one of the very few infections where we do that. And Guy wanted to say, ask, is this, a, is this a good thing to do, yes or no? And so his study was designed for that. So let's look at his study data. These were his results. This was dexamethasone and this was placebo. And so indeed he was able to confirm that dexamethasone does lead to increased survival in TB meningitis. But what you can see here is that the effect is really, really small. In fact, this effect is not even statistically significant. However, it has now, now it became the standard of care because even a small effect in a bad disease is going to be something that we will all want to try using. So everyone gets eight weeks of high dose Google dexamethasone uh, therapy along with uh, antimicrobials. Now, our prediction would be that the highs and the lows are dying for different reasons. Highs are dying because of too much inflammation. Lows are dying because of <clears throat> too little inflammation. So what do you think would happen in this if we were to now parse this by lta4h genotype who do you think would benefit from the dexamethasone and who would not the high inflammation yes very good so let's look and see if you're right so here's let's so this is placebo this is dexamethasone the placebos don't, uh, the heads don't seem to be doing very differently either, in either case. But look at the highs. In the placebo, placebo group, there is 50% mortality. In the dexamethasone, there's not even one case, one death. But this is a small, small study, so don't get too excited, but we were very excited. Now let's look at the lows. There's no benefit, and if anything, there's some um, there's some detriment, although I should warn you that a lot of this is being driven by just a couple of deaths, so I wouldn't get overly excited, but it is clear that the dexamethasone is not helping the lows. So we were very, very happy to see this. And now this gave us the impetus to say, all right, we're going to go back to the fish and we're going to really try to understand why. And I'm going to just try to race through this bit so you see where we got with this. So I, before we get there, I want to summarize what we did. So what we did was we started with the fish. And you know, I'm sure you know that the fish come from uh, the, the, the river Ganga. They come from all, all the tributaries of the Ganga in India, Burma, uh, sorry, Myanmar. Uh, all of those areas have the zebra fish and no other place does. Uh, as many things good, they were discovered by an Englishman. But that's another story for another day, a very interesting story. Um, but so we, we found the mutation in the fish. Then we went to Vietnam and we found that it corresponded to uh, resistance and susceptibility to, t uh, uh, to, TB, uh, to death from TB meningitis. And actually, we even went to Nepal and looked at a cohort of leprosy patients and showed that the, in leprosy, the, the heterozygotes or CTs had a tendency to get posse-bacillary or tuberculoid leprosy, and both TTs and CCs got uh, multi-bacillary leprosy. And this is a good time to acknowledge the people who uh, were involved in this. So Guy Thwaites did the trial in Vietnam. Um, Mary Claire King is a human geneticist. Um, who uh, was very kind and offered her 
help and guidance to help us through this complicated heterozygote advantage model. Tom Hahn was uh, an instrumental in getting us going with Guy. And then a number of people, uh, these are local doctors in the Vietnam and Nepal sites who were incredibly helpful in, in these studies. So now let's go back to the fish to understand mechanism. So what I've told you is that if you have optimal levels of LTA4H, and at this point I'm going to tell you that we already knew now that all the LTA4H effect was coming through modulation of TNF. If you had optimal LTA4H, you had optimal TNF, and if you had too little or too much LTA4H, you had too little and too much TNF respectively. So if you have optimal LTA4H, you manage to keep the bacteria in the granuloma, and then maybe you could slowly kill them through macrophage resistance mechanisms. If you have too little, what happens, we knew, we figured this out, you don't make enough TNF, and TNF is a key resistance factor. The, the macrophage needs TNF in order to keep the bugs, to kill the bugs slowly. And if you don't have enough TNF, the bugs outgrow the macrophages and they get out, they, they cause necrosis of the macrophages. The macrophages get, uh, die, the bugs come out, and once the bugs come out, they start growing in that sort of casein material. The high was the most interesting because when we, we saw that later in the game, they looked just like the lows in the fish. However, when we looked early, the macrophages controlled the bugs even better. They controlled them better than wild type, and yet suddenly they were, they were exploding. These few bugs would come out, and they would now start growing very quickly, and very soon they would grow so fast that they would look very similar to this site. So question now is, why is an excess of TNF causing this macrophage to die, even though it's controlling the bugs better because more TNF is good in that the bugs are being controlled better. Because we know that macrophages use TNF to control the bugs. So why then is this TNF killing the bugs? Okay, are you ready for this? This is a mechanism that was figured out entirely by Francisco, the postdoc from Spain who joined my lab. What he found was that when TNF engages the, the, its receptor, if it's an excess, it triggers this amazing pathway inside the infected macrophage. And so I'm going to walk you through this pathway. It triggers a couple of kinases called RIPK1, RIP kinase 1, and RIP kinase 3. And then the triggering of these kinases through a series of proteins that I'm not showing you causes the mitochondrion, remember that is the powerhouse of the cell, to overproduce reactive oxygen species. These reactive oxygen species are the reason that we initially see the better killing of the bacteria because mycobacteria have learned, have evolved to cope with the normal amount of reactive oxygen. But when you give them an excess of reactive oxygen, they're dying. And that is why we saw that initial improvement. However, we remember the, the cell itself is dying. Why is that? It's because this excess reactive oxygen is diffusing into the lysosome where the bugs are. So it's also starting to kill the bugs. However, in the lysosome, acid sphing sphingomyelinase. And acid sphingomyelinase causes the production of a lipid called ceramide. Ceramide activates a lysosomal protease. Remember, the lysosome is meant to kill things, and it's got lots of proteases. It activates a protease called cathepsin D. The cathepsin D leaks out of the lysosome by a mechanism we don't yet understand and it activates a cell death protein in the cytosol of the cell called BID. BID then goes along and activates a key cell death protein called BAX. 
BAX is a protein that is involved in apoptosis. It is well known to be involved in apoptosis, but in our system, we are not getting apoptotic death of the cell. We're getting necrotic cell death where the cell just ruptures. And so what is happening here, and this is something that is completely new, something that Fran found out, is that the BAX is going to the ER, the endoplasmic reticulum of the cell. And remember, the endoplasmic reticulum is a repository of calcium in the cell. And BAX is going to the ER and is triggering the ryanodine receptor. Does anyone remember the ryanodine receptor? Because it comes up in a couple of very dire medical conditions. Anyone know this? Have you heard of um, malignant hyperthermia and neuroleptic malignant hypertension? Post anesthesia complications? Yes. Sir. Yes. So that is the. the the thing that is in the receptor that's involved in there is the ryanodine receptor, and that is in neuromuscular cells where it causes the flow of calcium and um, an overload of calcium in the mitochondrion of the cell, and it causes overexcitement of the cell, and that's why these patients don't do well. But in our case, we're in a macrophage where the ryanodine receptor has never been thought to be involved. And yet, Fran showed that Bax goes along and activates the ryanodine receptor and it causes the flow of calcium from the ER into the mitochondrion of the cell. And once there is an overload of calcium in the mitochondrion of the cell, now it activates something called cyclophilin D. Cyclophilin D then goes along into the, into the inner membrane of the mitochondrion and causes the formation of a big pore and it's called the mitochondrial uh, permeability transition pore complex. So cyclophilin D activates that. And because you, if you activate that pore, you are going to get a loss of voltage potential because your voltage potential, all of your oxidative phosphorylation and your electron transport is happening in that inner membrane, remember? So if you, you know, the Krebs cycle is happening in the matrix, but then you're getting or your, your electrons flowing, your protons flowing in to the mitochondrion. This is biochemistry 101, the thing we all hate, but it's turning out to be important. And so if you lose the inner membrane of the mitochondrion, you're going to lose voltage potential and you're going to, and the cell just necrosis bursts open. And that is the pathway that's, that's being, being engaged in, in this system. And so now Fran had figured this whole thing out. Now this is just a very esoteric pathway. And you're going to tell me, God, I'm a medic at CMC Bello. Why should I care about this? And I'm, going to I'm, going to, I'm hoping to convince you that we should care about this because this knowledge has now led us to multiple new drugs to treat the high state in TB. And let's begin. So first we have First, we have reactive oxygen. So there is a drug that's used in the, as a health food supplement called N-acetylcysteine. And N-acetylcysteine is nothing but a scavenger of reactive oxygen. So Fran showed that if he treated the high TNF fish with N-acetylcysteine, he could reverse them to hyperresist. He could re reverse them to normal. They lost their susceptibility. Next one. We've got, remember, we've got acid sphingomyelinase in the pathway. And for that, a drug that is well known, it's a tricyclic antidepressant. And it is, it's one of its effects. We don't know if it's an on-target or off-target effect, but it's one of its known effects is to um, inhibit acid sphingomyelinase. So Fran treated the fish with dizipramine, which is one of the class, and showed that now the fish go back to being resistant. Next one. You will have, if, if you've remembered neuroleptic, uh, malig uh, neuroleptic um, malignant hypertension and malignant hyperthermia, you'll know that we treat those with dantrolene. And dantrolene is an inhibitor of the ryanodine receptor. So, drop, and since we knew the ryanodine receptor was involved, Fran used dantrolene, and again, he was able to reverse. And last one, before I get to the really exciting one, is there is a 
drugs, a drug in clinical trial that inhibits cyclophilin D. And I think it's in, it was initially uh, brought out by a small Swiss company for there are some uh, muscular dystrophies that are uh, mitochondrial, not Duchenne's, but there are uh, less common ones that are mitochondrial. And it was, it was introduced for that. I don't know the status with regard to those trials, but we, were, we got the drug from the company and we were able to show it to reverse it. And at this point, so Fran now had four host acting drugs that he could use in this pathway. And it's intuitive that these would be better drugs than steroids, which are very broadly anti-inflammatory and are potentially even bad for the low state, whereas these drugs should have no effect on the low state because this pathway simply isn't working in the low state. But this is when Fran had a really nice idea. For this, I want you to remember that the pathway ends up ultimately with this whole complicated merry-go-round what we end up with is calcium overload in the mitochondrion, correct? So Fran said, what if I just block calcium from going into the whole cell? And if I, min if I lower the calcium in the cell, I will have less calcium in the ER, and therefore I will have less calcium going into the mitochondrion, even if the pathway is working, and I should be able to treat this. And for that, there are multiple calcium channel blockers, verapamil, nifedipine, diltiazem, amlodipine. We use all of these drugs in many situations and you know, nifedipine and amlodipine are very common drugs and diltiazem is even used for atrial fibrillation. Uh, the, the nifedipine, amlodipine we use, you know, it's like sort of uh, like water for hypertension. So Fran used these drugs and lo and behold, he was able to totally reverse susceptibility. And of all of these drugs, I would say that these have the best side effect profile, particularly drugs like nifedipine and, um, and amlodipine. And so these are new host targeting drugs that you can get if you understand the biology of something. So uh, how are we doing for time? Are we up? Because we can stop right here if we're up for time. Yes, you can go on. Well, 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 how much time do I have? Pardon? 10 minutes. 10 minutes. I have 10 more minutes? Yes, ma'am. Okay, let's go then. All right. So, you know, when you do work like this, even though we went from, you know, we began with the cube, we went, we start, remember, let's, let's sort of walk back and see what we did. We started with a genetic screen in the fish. Then we went to humans and we said, look, uh, we can make a prediction in humans and it comes out right. But then the humans gave us a surprise that the high was bad. So we went back and we showed in the fish that the high was bad. We engineered the fish to make more and we again showed that the high was bad. And then we walked and then we showed this whole pathway. But people are very conservative and the knee-jerk reaction of anyone shown this pathway is, but you're working in the fish. You're working in, a, in an animal that diverged from humans more than 300 million years ago. How do you know that all of this is going to be the same? And if we tell them, but look, it's got the same molecules in the fish. These exact same molecules exist in humans and they're very identical genetically the answer that they will give us, we don't even wait for these answers. We, we know what the answers are going to be. The answers of the skeptics are going to be, okay, sure, we know all these molecules exist, but how do you know they signal the same in the fish? Maybe the signaling is totally different. And maybe you found this beautiful signaling pathway in the fish, but it has no relevance in humans. And so at this point, we have learned over time that we always have to go and try to do something in humans. So what we did this time was we got Laura Whitworth, who is a, 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 a research scientist in my lab, who's a highly trained human geneticist. And she is the one just for, you know, for, for I'm telling you just, this just for fun. She's the one who's actually interfacing with the group in Velour, DJ Christopher's group, uh, to, to do the human clinical trials. 
um, that are that are the studies that are going on in Velour. So she's an ace human geneticist, um, but she uh, just helped us out by doing some human macrophage work. So we took some cultured human macrophages and we said, let's test our predictions in the fish. So the uh, sorry, in human macrophages. So first prediction is that TNF will cause death. So what we did was we took macrophages and we can measure death in human macrophages. You can do it microscopically. So what we did was we took human macrophages. And so let me just walk you through this assay. The macrophages will be all on one dish. And in the dish, if you add the bacteria and then wait, some will get infected and some will not get infected. And then you can add in your TNF and you can say how many of the infected macrophages die and how many of the uninfected macrophages die. Now from the fish, we knew that you only infected macrophages respond to high TNF. So you need both the bacterium and the high TNF state for a macrophage to die. We don't fully understand this yet, but we know that it's at the level of, of producing overproducing reactive oxygen species. So right the beginning of the pathway here is depending on, dependent on this macrophage, both experiencing high TNF and being infected. And next year, I will tell you why, because I hope to know that by then. But this year, you, need, you just need to know that's the case. So now we go to the human macrophages. And we can ask, we can give them TNF and we can say, what do, do we see? Can we test the prediction that only infected macrophages will die? And look at this. In the same well, you can, these, the red are infected, the blue are uninfected, and on the x-axis is increasing numbers, increasing amounts of TNF, on the y-axis is the percent of macrophages dying. And you can see that there's a little bit extra death in the infect, uh, the, the, sorry, the infect, the, the, the macrophages are not dying if there's no TNF. But the minute you start adding TNF, you get this dose-dependent increase in macrophage death, and it's only in the infected macrophages. The uninfected are staying the same. So this is exactly what we were hoping to see. And then Laura did this in many, many more experiments to really validate this. And she was able to, uh, to show this in great detail. But now, uh, uh, so, so not in great detail, with great rigor. But now let's go and check out the rest of the pathway. Now in these macrophages, we can't make genetic mutations, but we can test the drugs and we can make predictions from the drugs. And so there is an inhibitor of RIPK1, and that's, it's not a human drug because it's, not, uh, uh, it's, not, it's a toxic drug for humans, but there, there is a drug called necrostatin-1, um, and you can see that necrostatin-1, and um, hang on a sec, I just need, yes, that uh, necrostatin-1, and there's another variant of it called necrostatin-1S, and you can see that that brings down the infected macrophage death. So let me walk you through this. Uninfect, uh, non-TNF treated, TNF treated, this is high death. The, the y-axis is always going to be percent death. So treated macrophages, high death. Treated, the, sorry, TNF high macrophages. TNF high macrophages with necrostatin one, no death, no death. So we could show now that it was also through RIPK1. Um, I'm going to skip over this because it's too much detail for you. And I'm going to move to the exciting part, which is um, the BID, because we had shown that BID was involved and there was a chemical inhibitor of BID, also not a human drug. And we could show that the chemical inhibitor of drug reduces death. So low, no TNF, high TNF, lots of death, remove the BID, and you get no death. But most excitingly for you guys, here are the human drugs, dantrolene and the cyclosporin, uh, cyclophilin D inhibitor. And um, you can see that both of them also reverse death. And even more exciting, 
is that we can take the three calcium channel blockers and we can show that we can reverse the cell death from high TNF. Now, all of this was done with mycobacterium marinum in human macrophages because we didn't yet have TB. And we decided we're just going to go and show this, go all out and show human macrophages with the human TB bacterium. So this is mycobacterium tuberculosis. And again, you see the same thing. You see, this is non, no, this is just normal TNF. This is high TNF. And you can see they too are dying. And now you can see each drug, dantrolene and three calcium channel blockers. So now we had taken this whole pathway and we had, we had discovered it. We had been guided by human genetics. And that's what clued us in to discover the pathway back in the zebrafish. And then we were able to confirm it all in human macrophages. And so um, with that, I, that, so this is just a picture of Fran and Laura after they got those last bits of results and you can see that they're pretty happy. And um, this is my lab on either side and this is a long corridor that's uh, because there's multiple labs going back, back to front here. So with this, I'm going to stop and I'm going to tell you, um, I'm going to just recap for you that the studying of TB, which is a disease, an infectious disease can uncover fundamental biology that you wouldn't have. Um, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Good. So, because remember, for example, we had no idea that the Ryanity receptor was involved, and we had no idea that a cell death protein lacks and engages the Ryanity receptor. And that's just two examples of new biology that we uncovered. The other thing it exemplifies is this concept of precision medicine. The idea that here you have what is called pharmacogenomic, pharmacogenetics, where you can find out what, uh, what genotype a patient is, and then you can treat the, the only give the corticosteroids to the right patient. I would also, Sam would like to argue that other than the high genetic LTA4A state, he thinks there are many other states where you have local increases in, uh, in TNF in the granules, and he thinks that these states will all have high TNF and therefore may have this pathway operating and therefore may benefit from these drugs that Fran has identified. Because of this pathway, we've shown you safe and inexpensive drugs that are available for other purposes that can be now used as post targeting drugs in both drug sensitive and drug resistant TB. And finally, uh, based on this work, we have a, a study ongoing with uh, Dr. DJ um, um, uh, uh, Christopher and Dr. Bala, Dr. Bala Mugesh in. Um, and many other groups are involved um, in Velour and recruitment is ongoing. And the question in that study is, will the, Indian, will, the, will the Indian patients behave the same with respect to um, corti uh, glucocorticoid responsiveness? Will the TTs be the ones to benefit the most from the glucocorticoids as they did in Vietnam? So stay tuned and hopefully we'll see the answers to that in a few years and uh, hopefully you'll see some more biology from us in a couple of years. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for that excellent uh, talk. Uh, we have time now for two questions from the audience. Please. Um, ma'am, I have a question for you. Um, so it looks like it is important to know the LTA4H genotype before you decide on starting steroids. Yes. As um, we do start steroids for all patients with TB meningitis. Yes. And we see uh, that patients do come back with paradoxical worsening. Um, so in, the, in this set of patients, uh, people have used infliximab um, to, as a TNF blocker. What, what are your comments about the use of infliximab? So I would say that um, 
the, let's, your first question was, what should we do about stealing? What Guy Thwait is doing currently in Vietnam is he's doing a perspective animation profile where he's TB meningitis patients come in, they get um, rapid genotyping. All the TTs are getting steroids, and the remaining targets and the lows are getting randomized to steroids and no steroids. And the question he's asking is, um, are we going to see, uh, you know, are they going to, are we going to fail to see a benefit of the steroids, which is what we would predict? And is there even some worsening with the steroids? Now, as to your question about paradoxical worsening, I don't know that, I don't think that paradox is uh, in general going to be through this pathway. And the reason I don't think so is because usually in paradoxical worsening, you're getting better, the bugs are getting killed. It's just that you're getting hyperinflammatory state. And in this case, what you're getting is, this is clearly a, a process where you're getting increase, you're getting bugs coming out. So you're getting more bacteria. And remember that in this pathway, the bug is needed right at the beginning. If you were to cure that macrophage of the bugs, it would no longer undergo necrosis, even in the high TNF state, because it needs the bug. And so a paradox is something else. And I actually had a bet with Ajit Lalvani about this. And because he, you know, in London, there are a lot of these paradox patients with the lymph, lymphadenitis. And I, he said, I'm going to test your pathway. And I said, it's not going to be. And I won my bet. So, uh, and I think he still owes me dinner. Right? He hasn't yet paid off the bet. So anyway, um, I don't think paradox is that. Now, as to the question of infliximab, infliximab is going to depend, your, if you want to give someone infliximab, it's going to depend on your, your belief that this is, that our pathway is the real reason. Whereas with steroids, you know they work, and you know that they're helping the teachers. So what I, would say, what I would say is that if you wanted to go to infliximab or if you wanted to go for it for the TTs, like if you wanted to test infliximab versus steroids, um, that's going to be a hard test because the steroids, the patients are doing really, in terms of sheer mortality, they're doing great with the steroids. However, what is hidden in that nice survival curve I showed you where none of, no one's dying is the morbidity. You know, if you give someone steroids for, I mean, you get someone steroids, a high dose steroids for eight weeks, particularly in many settings in India, that is not a happy, um, happy place to be for the patient. These are very broadly immunosuppressive. They are, you know, they, they, they mess up your bone. I mean, there's so many side effects. Right? You're, so these, so, so if we could get a more streamlined treatment, um, which is why we're so eager to try. I mean, for, imagine if we could do verapamil. What if these patients could, what if you took the highs and instead of giving them steroids, you gave them nifedipine? Wouldn't that be great? However, it's not going to be easy to do because you're going to have to do a randomized control trial of the two and people are very, very uneasy with taking something away that already works and you can't blame people for that. You know, if I got TB meningitis today and I was TT and you tell me what one, which one will you take? Uh, do you want the drug from your wonderful fish pathway or do you want steroids? I think I would just say steroids <laughs> or both. I would say maybe give me a little bit of each. <laughs> All right, so I'm sorry, but that's the best answer I can give you. <laughs> Any questions from the house, house staff, students? Nothing, no? Uh, uh, just one question. Uh, yes. I just was wondering the topic uh, you had dealt in uh, detail with uh, Dr. Lalta mainly deals with the immunological pathways involved. So when you study these in a clinical trial setting, how would we standardize the mycobacterial burden in a particular patient? Because let's say somebody has a high burden, somebody has a low burden, how would you sort of uh, see whether the effect you are seeing is because of the immunology or because of the burden of mycobacteria itself per se in a particular patient? 
Yeah, you know, this is a this is this is kind of a question at the heart of these kinds of things. This is this is your you are uh, you're you're really getting to the heart of the problem. And so one thing I will tell you is that you know we don't even know how to remember that measuring burden in TB meningitis is not great because uh, the sensitivity is 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 not great. Vietnam has one of the highest sensitivities. Uh, because what they, they, they're able to get a lot of CSF and they're able, they've, they've developed methods of concentration. They've actually done some homegrown methods, which we really want to bring to CMC Velour if, if at all possible. Uh, but in any case, for now, so, but one thing we could, what, so what we did do in those, those Vietnam studies, and there were actually two of them, I only showed you one, both gave the same result, was that what we could tell you was that the burden between the CCs, the CTs, and the CCs was no less in terms of uh, being smear positive, being culture positive, which are just our proxies for burden. And, and, and in fact, your question gets even more interesting because we don't know, because for example, the immunology itself could be affecting the burden, right? The burden could be affecting the immunology and the immunology could be affecting the burden. And so at this point, the most concrete results we have that it's coming up over and over, it's come up, we, we got the same result twice in Vietnam, and now once in Indonesia, is that the TT genotype responds uniformly well to steroids, and it seems to be independent of burden. But since you asked this, we've just been analyzing these data in more detail with a more complicated but better statistical tool. It's called Bayesian analysis. And this all came to be because my son is a mathematician, as in he's a just just graduated. And he brought a he introduced me to a professor of his who's very interested in Bayesian analysis, which is mathematically very it's it's intuitively great because it really assesses probabilities rather than just frequencies. But it's mathematically complex. So this he brought this guy to us and we've been reanalyzing the Vietnam and Indonesia data. And by the time the CMC data are ready, we'll, we'll know how to do this. And the very interesting thing that has come out, and this is like three days old, is that, you know, you, you know there's the, the, the scoring for TB meningitis. And the, you can either do the Glasma, Glasgow Coma score, or you can do what is more commonly done now, which is the BMRC grade, British Medical Research Council grades, and that's one, two, and three. And what we are seeing is that it is the grade twos that, that most of the effect of the TT, the most of the beneficial effect of the TT genotype in the face of getting steroids is in grade two. And, and what we think is happening is that the grade ones are doing well anyway. They're low grade and they're just surviving no matter what you do with them. They're indestructible. And the grade threes are so far gone that nothing is able to save them. And so your benefit is in the middle, but the good news is most people in both the Vietnam and Indonesia trials, most of the grades are in the middle and actually CMC is also the same from the data we've got so far. There are very few grade threes. So, you know, I think your question is asking is, is really brought together a lot of the complexities and I really, appreciate it because we want to be clear about the complexities you know we we can't get you know we can be excited because it's fun to be excited but we have to keep the realities in mind so this is this is a very long winded answer I hope it was okay thanks so much okay thank you very much ma'am for that uh, excellent and inspiring talk thank you very much